Thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm very, really happy to be here. And I would like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation to um, talk about uh, uh, principles of uh, muscle aging and also sarcopenia. Um, I was delighted when I saw that sarcopenia was uh, one of the topics to be discussed at this conference, because I think that there is a close connection between the topics that are going to be discussed here, HIV, aging, and muscle health. Um, so uh, my mission is, because I know the whole morning we'll be talk, we will be talking about sarcopenia and muscle, my mission will be to um, try to share with you or introduce to those of you who are not familiar with the muscle story, uh, and then prepare ourselves to listen more about sarcopenia as a relatively new condition. So um, let's start. These are my uh, conflicts of interest. Um, so when we talk about the skeletal muscle, and uh, it's, it's, uh, this is a very interesting type of tissue. First, because it goes from a complex, uh, a, a relatively uh, cohesive type of tissue or connection between different cells, but it starts here, and I would like to highlight this tissue as well, the bone. And please keep that tissue in mind because I'm going to come back to that connection between muscle and bone at the end of my talk. Then we have, of course, the different fibers. So we start with the muscle uh, fiber bundle, and then we go into the muscle fiber, and from the muscle fiber, we go to the myofibrils, and then we end up with the myofilaments, which are this tiny set of structures that we contract all the time, contract and relax all the time, and that facilitates our locomotion, our mobility, our independence. Interestingly, about 35 to 40 percent of our uh, body mass is muscle. So we are talking here about a component of our body that plays lots of roles in terms of our function, our biology, and also uh, in terms of uh, our metabolism. So muscle, all these uh, uh, myofibrils, play an important role in terms of, of regulating our glucose and other metabolic uh, uh, conditions. So um, those fibers that I show you at the end, they are not similar. They are not the same. They have different characteristics. I will not go into all the characteristics here, but I will tell you that there are type 1, type 2. And among the type 2 fibers, we have type 1, uh, type 2A, B, uh, uh, and X. And uh, those fibers are recognized uh, um, mostly based on their levels of activity, contractibility, metabolism. However, when you tell me uh, which fiber I would love and I would love to have in case a tiger jumps on top uh, in front of me and I have to rush and run, that I would prefer to have the type 2B fibers. These are the quick metabolic uh, acting uh, uh, fibers that immediately after I need to move them quick, they will help me to rush away or to or to stand up, get up from a chair very quickly, or do something that I can do uh, or I have to do uh, very fast. It's different to the type 1 fibers, which are very much uh, controlling our posture, you know, our movements, slow movements. So we don't need them uh, to be very active in that kind of stress situation. And this is important because more, you know, because older we become, the, uh, the, uh, we need these type 2 fibers, not, of course, to run away from a tiger, but to do things that we probably don't have to or don't require so much energy when we are young individuals. And that has been uh, something that we, or is something that we will discuss li in a little bit more detail. So this is the first probably message and our important component of this story that we are going to tell today is about these di major differences between the fibers. Despite they are in the same muscle, we have this type of different fibers. So um, then we go in th deep into the fiber, and uh, we uh, have several components, several players or determinants of that health in the muscle fiber. And also the response of the muscle fiber to these stressors or to demands for uh, mobility or, or, or any other kind of other function. So the first one is important here, the neuromuscular junction. This connection between the nerve 
on the muscle is an important determinant of how the muscle responds to the orders that co or the commands that come from the brain. So if that neuromuscular junction is, is uh, normal and is healthy, then this response will be very well coordinated. At the same time that we contract one muscle, there must be a group of muscles that should relax. Otherwise, we will be totally contracted. That's the, that's the principle. And that coordinated set of m contraction relaxation is controlled if, if by many central uh, and peripheral type of connections and neural connections and, and, and neural structures. But at the end, the, the, the structure that sends the message from the brain to the muscle is this neuromuscular junction. So the first very important component here is we need that plug. We need that neuromuscular uh, 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 junction plugged from the nerve to the muscle. If we disconnect that, if we disconnect somehow this uh, neuromuscular junction, this nerve uh, 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 from the muscle, then the muscle will not be able to uh, respond and function. The second important component, and this is what we do a lot at my lab, is the uh, mesenchymal stem cells that we observe in the muscle. The muscle stem cells and what we call the fibroadipogenic uh, 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 cell uh, progenitors, sorry, fibroadipogenic progenitors, those are two cells, two types of cells that are very interesting because they are uh, used to recover, to, to heal the, the muscle. So these cells have the capacity to produce new cells, new myoblasts, new myocytes, and um, they, in a different way. But uh, just uh, let's keep in mind this one, the FAP cells, the fibroadipogenic progenitors, because they have the capacity, and that's why they call fibroadipogenic, because they can become fibrotic, or they can become fibroblasts, I will say, or they can become adipogenic, so they can become fat, at the same time that they can become muscle. So, and you will see at the end of my talk, how are we go, how do all these things connect with what we observe relate regarding the changes uh, 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 triggered by aging in the muscle. And the third important component here is the blood vessel. So, of course, we need this uh, good uh, uh, circulation and blood uh, flow into the muscle in a way that uh, the muscle can, you know, get enough blood flow, uh, oxygenation, uh, metabolic components, and uh, then release all these uh, uh, myokines, all these factors into the circulation and regulate many other functions around the body. So um, these are, again, the three major components. And these are the components that I'm going to describe uh, in, my, in the rest of my talk regarding changes that are triggered by aging itself and by alterations in aging, so what we call normal aging and what we call I wouldn't say pathological aging, I will say, I will call it unsuccessful aging uh, uh, and, and as, a, as a concept. So, but at the same time, uh, this is a lot of biology here, but, uh, but we have other factors that regulate the function, the growth, and the development of the, our muscles. So we have uh, factors such as lifestyle, as biological, psychosocial. I like this, I like this, this figure because it shows how all these multidimensional connections between, uh, between the uh, biological factors that I already described, but also the lifestyle factors. Of course, if somebody, our children, are exposed to exercise from the very young age, of course their muscles will be healthier that, than those children that unfortunately they spend much more time you know, watching their screens or playing, uh, I don't know, wi Wi-Fi or I don't remember, I don't play anymore. But um, the, that's the, the major difference. And it's also a difference between somebody who is aging and does exercise than somebody who is just uh, a, a, a sedentary person. Same with the psychoso psychosocial factors. There are factors such as, you know, occupation, for instance. Some of us spend lots of time sitting in front of a desk, uh, in front of a screen, and some of us uh, also have very active, you know, builders. So this exposure to different stimulation to the muscle will generate a different way of aging. So what I want to say here is we reach different points of uh, muscle activity and muscle growth, and from there we start declining progressively 
in a way that uh, the muscles start changing in terms of uh, several components that I will describe soon. So, um, and that's when the, uh, what we call hallmarks of aging step in. I don't know if you are familiar with this concept of hallmarks of aging, it's becoming a hot topic now. Mm, and basically what we describe, or what has been described, is these several changes, several components uh, that regulate uh, the aging process. I will not go into all of them. Today we're going to hear about a couple of them. But um, in this concept of the uh, hallmarks of aging, I will not go again into the groups of, or nothing like that, but we have, for instance, alterations in epigenetics or changes in epigenetics or alterations, and this is very relevant for us in this story, alterations and changes in stem cells, what we call stem cell exhaustion that happens in a during aging process. Mitochondrial changes, we are going to hear about that today. Nutritional changes. Uh, and also some kind of metabolic processes such as proteostasis. All this together, all together, these hallmarks of aging are important determinants of how we age. So if we have a healthy mitochondria, a healthy proteomics, healthy metabolomics, uh, and again, all these different components are functioning well, then we have uh, what we call a healthy aging, a successful aging. But when any alterations that happen in one or several of these mechanisms will determine that the, um, the muscle will start aging in some people faster, in some people slower. But we experience, we all experience changes in those components of the hallmarks of aging. The important point also from here, from the hallmarks of aging, is that now in, uh, in our field, we are trying to target several of these mechanisms to treat more than one chronic condition. So we are not, we are, we are, this is the new concept that we call geroscience. Geroscience being the concept that, okay, uh, uh, we, our vision of one, uh, one disease, one, ta one uh, therapeutic target has been changed. So I, to identify these different mechanisms that are shared by different conditions, and then we can say, okay, we're going to target several uh, diseases at the same time. And what we see in the aging muscle is uh, very clearly described here. We have in the young, uh, healthy muscle, we have nice fiber one and two. I hope you remember about the fibers one and two. They are very well balanced. We have enough fiber to be, to respond to our demands. But what, and then, and we have all these nice stem cells from both the fab cells and the stem cells, healthy, going around, ready to, re, to, to uh, repair the muscle. But what happens in the aging bone, in the aging muscle, sorry, is that we have this loss of type 2B fibers. And we lose them in two ways. In, a, in one way is that they become, instead of becoming two, type 2B, they become type 1. So they, don't, they are not going to respond the same way. And in, in the second uh, uh, characteristic is that we, re we don't replace type 2B with new type 2B, we replace them with type, two, type 1. And that's unfortunately because in that way, we are not going to be able to do things and to perform the same that we did when we were in our 20s or 30s. And the second uh, component of these changes in aging uh, muscle is the appearance of high levels of fat infiltrating the muscle. And that fat comes from the precursors that I already mentioned before. That fat star starts infiltrating the muscle. And, and I will show you some of the pictures describing that. And the third component is that neuromuscular junction that I mentioned before it starts detaching. So it starts unplugging. Um, and uh, in a history of, uh, so, sorry, sorry, of uh, egg and chicken, we don't know where, is whether the fiber retracts and then the nerve the unplugs, or whether it's the nerve that gets destroyed or somehow affected and then the fiber shrinks. That's a discussion for in the muscle field that could take years to, 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 to get an agreement. Um, 
because I know this particular conference uh, is interested in HIV, I, I wanted, uh, you remember all the list of uh, all the hallmarks of aging, we have what we call inflammaging. So we know that with aging, there is a chronic inflammatory process, very subclinical inflammatory process, a, a, a storm, a literal storm of, uh, of, uh, of uh, interleukins and other factors that are inflammatory, that are triggered by who knows, we know that there are some changes in the, in the immune system, but we observe that in every person who is aging. Some people with higher levels of inflammation, some people with lower levels of inflammation, but at the same time, what we observe in the aging muscle is, and this is just a, a, a summary of all that happens just from one, one of the hallmarks of aging, one of them, but this chronic inflammation is also seen in, um, of course, and trigger and probably higher. I'm not an expert in HIV, I must admit, I don't, I don't. But uh, uh, in viral infections, we know that uh, such as cytomegalovirus and uh, also in, in HIV, uh, this chronic inflammation process is triggered or is probably potentiated. And this starts affecting, starts affecting the muscle in a way that this inflammation starts uh, 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 destroying, in, in some sense, the neuromuscular junction and affecting the conversion of the cells and triggering, and this is important, triggering adipogenesis in the, in, the, in, the, in the muscle. When we have more fat inside the muscle, we have more inflammation locally, and that's more inflammation, more destruction of fibers, and it becomes a vicious cycle. Again, this is just an example. I selected this one because of the, of the characteristics of the audience today and because I know you are excited about this topic of, of inflammatory, chronic inflammation, so I just wanted to focus on that one for today. For those of you who are clinical in the room, this, we, can, we observe this, all these changes induce uh, uh, what we call age-related muscle loss. This is a study that we did in Australia when I was there in, at the University of Melbourne uh, with uh, 15,000 participants from a very young age, about 20-year-old uh, to 80-year-old, uh, and men and women, and uh, we use data from DEXA scans, from densitometries, uh, body composition. So this is lean mass. You know, it's not, I'm not talking here about muscle mass, but this is lean mass, which is the approximate uh, surrogate of uh, muscle mass, and I know one of our speakers today, Peggy, will talk about this um, more, uh, uh, more in detail. But I want to show is that, and this is normal aging. These were healthy volunteers. And these healthy volunteers, these healthy participants, lost uh, muscle mass progressively. And uh, also you can see here how similar the curves are for men, for men and women. Um, women had a little bit lower in terms of their muscle mass, but, or lean mass, sorry, but we observed this decline. And this is, uh, without doubt, is at this moment the largest uh, study on body composition uh, in the world from healthy volunteers um, where we, ca we, we can report these changes. So these are the clinical consequences of all the biological changes that I already mentioned. But this is what we call normal aging process of the muscle. That represent about, represents about 0.5 to 1% of our muscle mass per year of, of lo loss in muscle mass in a normal way, normal with, of course, with the standard deviations. And it's not only mass, it's also that we start losing a little bit of a strength. And here is where I want to make the, the, the point that there is the majority of us go through this process of losing muscle mass or lean mass, and we start also losing the muscle strength in an age-related process. So, we don't, we're not crossing the border into pathology. But there is a subgroup of people who really are affected in a much more significant way. And that's where there is a clear differentiation between talking about normal aging and disease. And when I talk disease in this case, we're going to talk about sarcopenia. And all this sarcopenia, all this uh, elements of the 
uh, of the hallmarks of aging are affected in sarcopenia. And we know that when they are present, they are affecting many, many of these. We have factors that trigger. So this, we have the baseline, our normal aging, age, aging process in the muscle, but there are these factors that trigger a more accelerated uh, loss of muscle mass and strength and function. And these are you know, chronic conditions, and uh, probably I, 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 uh, I, I would include the HIV in this kind of groups, uh, inflammation, I already mentioned, and all these, I will not go into all of them, but definitely when all these uh, factors are, are together, then they affect the muscle in a more significant way inducing the appearance of sarcopenia. And this is what we observe in a muscle with sarcopenia. We observe very few fibers, lots of fat, lots of fat, and lots of fat not only around the cell, but also inside the cell, which is terrible. This is very toxic fat. This fat affects the function. It generates an inflammatory, um, an inflammatory uh, milieu. And uh, is, uh, that's why we propose, we have been proposing for a while, that sarcopenia is a lipotoxic disease. I'm not talking here about obesity. I'm not talking here about the fat that develops in our viscera or our subcutaneous. I'm talking about a fat that is very characteristic of this tissue with aging that affects, infiltrates, comes from the cells that I already mentioned, infiltrates the muscle and affects the function in multiple ways, affects not only the metabolism, uh, the metabolic uh, role of the muscle, but also induce muscle dysfunction and mobility dysfunction. But I hope you remember my first slide when I say that there is, there is the, the, the bone also plays an important role. And bone and muscle are interconnected. They're probably the most interconnected tissues in our body. All together, they represent 55% of our body mass, they are communicating each other from the very beginning of the embryonic stage. But more importantly, when we look at the risk factors that I show you already as uh, triggering sarcopenia, those are exactly the same risk factors that trigger osteoporosis, which is the other side of the story. We have normal age-related bone loss, yeah, but when we lose too much in the presence of these risk factors, we cross the line into osteoporosis. And, and that's why we have proposed uh, for a while now the concept of osteosarcopenia when sarcopenia is combined or happens at the same time than osteoporosis. Again, the risk factors are similar. The fat, the role of fat and adipokines is very significant in these patients. They are at much higher risk of suffering uh, the outcomes that are going to be discussed later on. And of course, if there is a chronic process of inflammation or inflammation in chronic conditions such as HIV, these two tissues should be considered as, a, as, as together. So if we observe alterations in the muscle, I invite you to, to have a look at the bones because something else is happening at the same time. And um, as I was mentioning, you know, the, the risk of uh, outcomes, uh, adverse outcomes is increased. And we already, we can see that in clinical practice. So I'm not talking here about sophisticated esoteric things. These are things that we can see in practice. We can already, or we have already seen, this study by Andy Wong from, from Toronto, where uh, in 312 uh, postmenopausal women, they quantify fat infiltration in muscle and bone. They happen at the same time. And this fat infiltration in muscle and bone, independently of BMI, not related with obesity, triggers uh, events such as falls and fractures. Whether somebody, I tried, but somebody has looked at, uh, at this particular context, muscle and bone loss, synchronic muscle and bone loss in HIV patients, I'm really, really interested in listening about. I know there has been several groups, uh, and we collaborate with a group in Italy, and, uh, and, and Dr. Julian Falutz, who is here, is also a collaborator. Um, but, and, and, but we need more to evaluate, more, more data and more evidence to evaluate this, because it's an interesting field in which we can observe these changes. So in summary, with aging and the presence of risk factors, 
poor nutrition, hypogonadism, and there is a higher differentiation into adipocytes and instead of myocytes. Physical inactivity and poor nutrition are key drivers of this phenomenon. Uh, osteoporosis and sarcopenia and osteosarcopenia are lipotoxic diseases as um, probably inflammatory, chronic inflammatory conditions, uh, as I mentioned there. And there's a clear biological and clinical difference between normal and pathological aging from the muscle perspective, of course, from the bone perspective. And with this, I would like to thank all our collaborators around the world who helped us to generate some of this evidence that I show you today, and the people who paid the bill uh, and down there. Uh, with this, I thank you very much for your invitation and looking forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you very much, and for your questions. <laughs>